This Red Nose Day, your donation will help people here in the UK and around the world live free from poverty, violence, discrimination and support them with their mental health. This includes helping people right now in Ukraine and the mass displacement of people in many parts of the world. Head to comicrelief.com forward slash podcast mashup to give what you can now. I'm a bisexual woman, but if I was offered a no-strings-attached night with John Hamm Mm -hmm. or Elizabeth Moss, I would ask for a cocktail with a side of January Jones. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't just be like, sure, Elizabeth Moss. Because the audience know I wouldn't be able to say no to John Hamm because he is my long-time pin-up. The way that I would try and counteract it is just to say, look, yes, of course I want to explore my bisexuality with Elizabeth Moss, but could we make it a threesome? Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to leave John Hamm out after all these years. It would seem churlish. It would be hurtful to him because he knows about it. I know quite a few people have told him about the show and how I talk about him. And it would be hurtful. I can't hurt John Hamm in that way. But... I would add January Jones into the mix if she were willing and consensual and up for it, which why wouldn't she be? Uh, because then there would be three women and one man. Right. That would be yeah. my way of counting. It's like carbon yeah. offsetting queerness. It's what? Carbon offsetting queerness. <laughs> it's like, but if I have two women, it's okay that I've invited John Hamm. Yeah, you see what but I'm you're afraid that you're just going the straight route because it's easy and going for John Hamm. It's just that I feel... You know, if it was any other man, I'd just be like, oh, no, we'll just... Elizabeth Moss and I will go in. It's Mm, just I feel mm. I can't let John down. Yeah. I owe him so much. (laughs) Do you know what? I just don't fancy John Hamm at all. I don't see it. Well, we can go out in the pool together. (laughs) And if he's in a bar, there'll be no... There'll be no argument at all. There'll be no fight. There'll be no fight. What is it about him that you like? (sighs) We don't have time. (laughs) It's about, to be honest, I don't know how much I, you know, I hope, I, he seems like really good fun. He's got a great sense of humour. But there's something about the character of Don Draper. Yeah. Who, that, it's that, it's that sort of, I, I, one of my very first ever I'm a feminist Barts was I'm a feminist but I sometimes fantasise about being sexually dominated by famous fictitious misogynist Don Draper. Mm. And truly believe that if I met him, I could heal his pain and make him whole. (laughs) And there is something about men like that where they're like, oh, he's so troubled, I could untrouble him. Does anyone else have that? That they want to untrouble troubled men like it's our fucking responsibility to iron out the problems of, of, of a handsome man who's got every advantage, but we can't get over his past. And, you know, we all can't get over our past. But why is that? He doesn't think it's his job to get my problems done. He never thinks about that, does he? No. But is, it, is it a bit like Wordle, where they're like... <laughs> <laughs> they're like a, a, a thing you want to solve. Yes, it's sexual Wordle. That's yes. exactly what it is. Yeah. Who, who is attracted to sexual Wordle? Just give us a cheer. <laughs> who, who doesn't want to know about sexual Wordle? Okay. <laughs> yeah, only three people... Don't want and you you are you Don't over your sexual, sexual wordle phase? Never had a sexual wordle. You never phase. had one. Mm, actually, sorry, that's not entirely true. Of course it isn't. There's been moments, but on the whole, that madness doesn't do anything to me. Lucky, lucky, lucky you. Mm. I, I'm a gay man, but I love a trip to B and Q. I love yes. it in there. Yeah. I mean, I'm a bisexual woman, but I love a trip to S and M. Which one's S and M? Sadomasochism. Oh, I thought I genuinely thought it was a DIY store. <laughs> it's like they do tiles, don't they? <laughs> Are you in fact a lesbian? <laughs> <laughs> but this is it. You see, that's an example of the response it gets. It's like, no, I just love it in there. I feel like I'm coming home. <laughs> from King's Place in London. The Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Homo Sapien with me, Deborah Francis White, and Chris Sweeney with music from Maisie. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming out. Welcome to The Guilty Feminist. 
delighted to see so many of you. Um, it's what, really wonderful to have you here. Now, it's yeah. Valentine's. It's Valentine's. I know it's very exciting. Uh, just, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else has heard. It's Valentine's. Um, just give us a cheer if you are uh, sort of uh, stridently single. Just give... So single and really fucking happy about it. Because to your, uh, based on your experience, it's way better than being in an entanglement, a confusing entanglement with another human being who has expectations of you and whose expectations uh, of yours are never met. Just give, give us a cheer. Give us a cheer if you're stridently and enjoyably single. Give us, a, give us a cheer if you're here to sort of really get away from Valentine's. Okay, give us a cheer if you are, and I, I, I don't... I don't I don't really know how to put this. In love. Uh, Give us a cheer if you're in a long-term relationship, but you're like, meh. I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to last. Give us a cheer if you're here. If you're in a relationship, you're here without your partner. Yeah, it's Valentine's Day. Your relationships are not long for this world, are they? Let's be honest. If if you're a feminist who's who's left your partner on Valentine's Day to come out and be with other feminists, but you haven't invited your partner to come because you've thought, you're not going to get it. I don't really want you there, to be honest. Just give us a cheer. Okay, great. I'll give us a cheer if you invited your partner, but they went, no, I'm all right. (laughs) Just just one person went, yep, no, no, I know. Give us a cheer if you got here, but for some reason or other, your date stood you up. Oh. There was an audible gasp. Was that because you just realised that had happened to you? Or you like, fuck me, I just realised. They made up a big story about a bus, but that just took me up. Um, give us a cheer if you're on the apps. Why are you so happy about it? They're awful. Hmm? Research. Tell me more, tell me more, like, does she have a car? Um, I need to know more about why you're on the apps for research. Um, I, um, Sorry, I'm Deborah. What's your name? Uh, Lulu. Lulu. Uh, so I've got an ongoing theatre project, which is, we're doing a radio series of, about dating <gasps> and how horrific they are. Oh, so your wahoo yeah. was you're on dating apps to bring them down <laughs> to their knees. So you're doing a theatre project about how horrific apps are, and you're the only one who sounded happy about being on apps. Everyone else is like, yeah. And you were like, woohoo! Um, so, uh, because this is your, uh, your, your attempt to end, end apps, which is the worst one? Are you discovering? Oh, God. It depends who you are, I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah probably something Bumble is the worst one. Bumble's the worst one? I did not see that coming at all. Yeah. I thought Bumble would be a good one, because it isn't Bumble meant to be ladies first or something. Yeah. The toxic men take advantage of Bumble. I, sh- I don't think... I think I'm a feminist, but I think I might have just said ladies first. I don't think that's a... I was trying to sort of sum up what it was. Isn't Bumble... Bumble is... Women can make the first move, but men cannot make the first move. So how do toxic men make... take advantage of the Bumble philosophy? They swipe right on absolutely everybody. Oh. They decide when somebody gets in touch with them whether they want to so, uh, so they swipe right on absolutely everyone and then when they see what their winnings are they then go that one, that one, not that one. so they oh I see I see. okay we've cancelled all the guests tonight it's just you and me <laughs> analysing dating apps at a, Chris Sweeney in the dressing room I'm so sorry you, you've been replaced by a woman but it was bound to happen you came on The Guilty Feminist knowing it could happen at any moment. I hope Chris is laughing in the green room and not weeping. Chris, we're joking. We're joking. We're getting to you. We're getting to you. But uh, uh, have you analysed any queer apps or, or queerness within the apps? Okay, Cupid, a little bit. Okay, Cupid. Uh, is it better if it's same sex? Um, I mean, I'm not fussing, really. No, I don't mean you. I don't mean is your... S- I don't mean, it. are your sexual encounters better if they're same sex? Answer, I'm not fussy, really. I mean, are there better behaviours among same sex people on apps? But that was the best answer anyone, any of us could find. There's going to be no better joke tonight. If you're looking for a better joke than that tonight, please leave now because there won't be one. 
you peaked. We've peaked together. We've peaked as a gang. Or if you're just coming in, you've missed the best part of the show. I'm so sorry. You're only a few minutes late. We're only doing the warm up, but something wonderful's happened already. Oh, are you on apps? If you've just come in, are you at the wrong show? Oh, they've come out. They're going out. Oh, I, oh, they've taken that literally. Peaked right. Fuck off. We're leaving. They were in the wrong show, were they? No, they're going around the other side. Oh, they're at the wrong side. Okay, well, when they come in again, let's all shout surprise. Okay, ready? I'm going to go, I'll, I'll give you the... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point to you. Shh. Surprise! That wasn't... The, the reaction wasn't as strong as we were hoping for. They're still just looking for their seat numbers. They're still just looking for their seat numbers. So look, we do need... If you've analysed it at this length, we're going to have to get you on the show another time to just... I'm just going to grill you for information. Are you happy to give it to us? I mean, you've got your own project on. You may just be like, no, fuck off, come to my show. Uh, Both of those things. Both of those things. Okay. Well, if we can grill you information, we'll collectively, everyone here tonight will come to your show. How about that? Where's the show going to be on? Cock blocked by COVID. <laughs> That's the name of all of our autobiographies as well, my friends. <laughs> Cock blocked by COVID. It's the best two years of my life. <laughs> um, so we're doing an audio drama series instead. You're doing an audio drama series instead. Okay, and where where, where will that be out? Pitch to me. We do House of the Guilty Feminist stuff now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, all right. The rest of you can go. Um, we'll be planning a really good drama for you here. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, seriously, though, let's talk. Um, let's talk after the show. Uh, what's your name again? So I'm Lulu. Lulu. I'm so bad at that. I have to hear every name five times. Um, and I also am mildly face blind. I need to get diagnosed, but I know that I am. Um, so I need to meet you five times and hear your name five times. And then I won't quite know where I know you from. And it's so debilitating. Um, so, uh, but Lulu, I will remember so many reasons. Um, but mostly, I'm not fussy. Um, we need to know more about this. It's so intriguing. Um, now, I am a serial monogamist when it comes to podcasts. Um, I get involved with a podcast and then I just obsess about it and I listen to it morning, noon and night. Does anyone else have that experience? Yes. Okay. Hopefully you're all deeply in love with the Guilty Feminist at the moment and are not cheating on me with some no such thing as a fish or, I don't know, what's that mag, ma, snog married annoyed? That's not our scene really, is it? I, I'm sure they're lovely. Is there, are there any crossovers between snog married annoyed and us? Just give us a cheer. No. It's not, it's not a crossover podcast with us. It's not a crossover. I'm sure they're lovely. I'm sure they're lovely. Give us a cheer for another favourite podcast. Of, give us a shout out another favourite podcast. Hoovering. What's the other one? You're wrong about. You're wrong about. I don't know now if that's a podcast or a heckle. <laughs> um, you're wrong about. So it's, a, it's what you think you know something, but then they explain why you're wrong. Is this your podcast, sir? <laughs> that's a lot like your podcast. Is it, is it yours? No. Okay. Is it, and I need to be very clear about this question, is it, is it a podcast of a man's? Uh, oh, it's a gay man. Okay. It's a man and a woman. It's just, it's just, you're wrong about it to sound like a lot like a straight man's podcast, isn't it? I'm not going <laughs> to... Delighted to hear it by a gay man and a woman, but it does sound a lot like parties I've been to and men I've been trapped with. <laughs> Are you wrong about this? <laughs> So I look, I trust you, sir. I trust you. I trust you, and I will listen to it. Uh, any other podcast that you love? Joe Rogan's pretty great. I'm kidding. Someone in the front row just said Joe Rogan's pretty great. And then, and then so quickly went, I'm kidding, because she was worried she was going to be mobbed. She just went, Joe Rogan's pretty great. I'm kidding. Please don't attack me. Uh, who else? Esther Perel? Empire. What's that? Lost spaces. Okay, great. Yeah. 
Oh, queer spaces that have been shut down internationally. That sounds like a sad podcast, if I'm honest. So, but, but is it a way to kind of then help those queer spaces stay open or reopen or... Really interesting. Okay, so that leads me, segues me brilliantly to our show tonight. Uh, because our show tonight is a podcast that I got obsessed with. Um, it's a podcast called Homo Sapiens. And the emphasis is on the homo part of that. Um, because it's about all things queer. And I started listening to it. Uh, it's The host is Chris Sweeney. For a, a long time he hosted it uh, with Will Young. And then for a long time he hosted it with Alan Cumming. Uh, he's now hosting it alone and having uh, various... You know, guests, really brilliant, brilliant guests on. Um, it's so fascinating and so wonderful. And as I discovered my own queerness, this was a real guide uh, for me and, and a map and a compass. Um, and so I, I reached out to Chris and said, I really love your show. And um, I don't know, can I be on it? And um, I didn't say it that crassly, but it was clear <laughs> that I was heavily hinting, can I be on it? Because podcasters don't reach out to each other to say, I love your show, unless they... What they're really saying is, can I be on it? And Chris said, why don't we do a crossover show? And crossovers are my favourite thing in the world. Uh, So tonight, the guilty Homer Sapien. Please welcome to the stage the incredible Chris Sweeney! Hello, everyone. Did you hear me saying nice things about you? I heard some stuff. (laughs) How Who's you, replacing me? How did you know? How did you know it was Lulu? Because I was looking on the screen. Oh, uh, I see. We've got all sorts back there. Okay, all right. Drinks, um, nibbles. Um, hi. <laughs> Hello. Here we are for our first ever episode of the Guilty Homo Sapien. Um, Ooh, water. Y- yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Now this I've is... been told to watch this timer. Oh yeah. Is that Tom Selinski that told you that? He's yeah. obsessed with time. He said, the problem with Deborah is she goes through the time. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers all. Happy I mean, Valentine's. Thank you. I don't like hearing the problem with Deborah. Mm. <laughs> I'm no, I think he's a challenge, to be fair. How is that better? <laughs> the challenge with Deborah. That the is just code for sorry, problem. I forget. I'm so silly. He said, that the thing I love about Deborah. <laughs> I feel you've come right into our Valentine's Day. And smashed it up. I feel like you've come in. To, he sent me flowers this morning. Did he? Yeah, and I thought, oh, what a lovely man. Mm-hmm. And now it turns out he's been bitching me behind my back at my own show. <laughs> well, Deborah, my husband's here tonight. And did he send me flowers? I don't know. <laughs> I've no information on that. Evening, darling. What's your husband's <laughs> name? William. William. Um, where are you? Just give us a shout if you're William. If you're, if you're married to the He's there. He's right shout. there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, He's off to the florist. Uh, <laughs> did you give each other cards? Do you do any Valentine anything? Do you know? Oh my god! Oh my god! This is amazing. Oh, oh, we wow! We could not have planned this better, and we didn't plan it. Clearly, this we didn't plan amazing. it because I didn't know his name. Um, Thank you William, so much. So lovely to meet you, and I'm so happy I set you up for that so brilliantly. Yeah. So um, you had brought, just to be clear, what happened? Did you steal those from someone you saw at the back who'd been given them by a boyfriend, <laughs> rip them out of someone's hands, or you had? Why were they at the back? So you bought them ready for later. Okay. Oh right. bless. So did, what did you get, William? Well, this is it. I've walked into this. Well, no, you're giving him a performance exactly. in which you're going to talk about your love for him on stage mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sing All You Need Is Love mm-hmm. a cappella. Mm-hmm. So that's nice of you. Yeah, I think we're running out of time. <laughs> I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Chris, could you please tell us if people are listening to The Guilty Feminist, they're listening to this on our feed or they're here in the audience tonight, could you give us the elevator pitch by the Homo Sapiens podcast? So the Homo Sapiens podcast is the world from a queer perspective. So uh, this is a bit longer than elevator. So I love well, women. Well, the elevator are... might be going for 20 floors. So that's fine. Uh, floor 19. We might get so we stuck. Hold on. <laughs> um, I love Women's Hour on Radio 4. Yep. And it's the world from a female perspective. Mm-hmm. 
Turns out lots of gay men listen to it. Turns out lots of men listen to it. So years ago, I said, why has no one done the queer version of this? So what does the world look like from a queer perspective? So you can talk about news, you can talk about entertainment, you can kind of talk about everything, which is what I love about it. And our little tagline is, what I love about Women's Hour is you could have Michelle Obama on one day, but the next day you could be talking about bunions. And <laughs> we can do the same. You can sort of do everything. So the dream Woman's Hour episode would be Michelle Obama has bunions. Yes. That's the, <laughs> yes. the absolute dream for What everybody. would her treatment be? It would be... I don't know. I, feel, I always find Woman's Hour... I mean, obviously I'm delighted that Woman's Hour exists, mm. but it does imply that all the other hours on Radio 4 are for men. Yes. <laughs> so, and, also, and now men's 23 hours. <laughs> and also... 40% of their listeners are men, so often in the editorial Those room... Those bastards can't about. let us have anything. I know. And, um, yeah, so it, I completely agree. And uh, so we thought, why not do it for queer people? Oh, so. It's a wonderful idea. If you haven't listened to it and you are exploring your queerness or you're curious about your pansexuality that you think might be latent, uh, and you know, I, I had... Um, well, I suppose, uh, what my friend Carrie Quinlan calls late-onset lesbianism. Mm. <laughs> um, uh, I sort of went, I started going, oh. Um, uh, and I think that's one reason I was really interested in talking to Chris about this. Uh, because if you're the kind of bisexual I am, um, you, it's like being offered a box of chocolates. Life is offering you a box of chocolates, not to get too far as gump about it. And you're only seeing the top tray. And so the tray that I was being offered was men because everything in the world told me that's who I should be looking at. Mm. Um, I had an experience of, as many of you know, uh, growing up in a cult where I wasn't allowed even to masturbate. Um, and I didn't. I didn't masturbate. Um, but I assumed I was straight because I watched Dirty Dancing like as a teenager, like honestly, probably 50 times. Um, uh, which I think you will agree makes my feat of not masturbating far more impressive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my, I was being directed to look through baby's eyes and she was always looking at Johnny. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if I were a dyed-in-the-wool chartered lesbian with no other options, of course my gaze would have gone over to Penny, the leggy blonde. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's right. Yes, that's right. I'm Leg a feminist, almost. but I've said leggy blonde. <laughs> Please email, it's only a joke, at comeonnow.com. Um, but uh, I, didn't think, I didn't think to because everything was directing me there. So for me, it's like all your life you've been offered a box of chocolates and it's only when you've eaten all the chocolates except the strawberry ones that you think, what's under this top tray? And you discover underneath is another tray of tits. <laughs> Should we explain a bit about our format? Yeah, we should actually. I'll tell you why. Because because we because <laughs> the time is nearly up. Okay. Well, it's funny because we were talking, um, and which I discovered I was waiting to come on stage because you wanted to come on the podcast. Um, but we were saying, you know, you do. I'm a feminist, but mm. but so many of our listeners say I'm a gay man, but I'm a trans woman, but mm -hmm. and then they say something that they feel they don't identify with within the queer community. Mm -hmm. And it's so common uh, that we were like, well, why don't we do something that's about that? So we've got lots of very funny ideas from our Great. listeners of things. And that's the format of your show. So what in our crossover tonight, in our, in our mashup, um, we would love to hear what your listeners have said. Okay, so um, let's have a listen to the first voice note from Hayley. Hello, Homo sapiens. I am a bisexual woman but I've never seen a single episode of The L Word. Now, whenever I admit this to any of my friends who identify as lesbian, they always have the same reaction, which is to audibly gasp and then look at me as though I've done something horrific. I, I'm really sorry. Maybe I'm waiting for the B word. Oh! oh. Didn't Desiree Akaban do sort of do the B word? I don't know. What was that? A Channel 4 show called The Bisexual. Oh. Mm. I have not watched that. I've never watched the L word. Okay, just give us a cheer for your L word, people. <laughs> what lesbians tend to say to me mm -hmm. is 
we watched it because it was all we had. Mm. We know it wasn't very good. Yeah. And Will we, and Grace. Yeah. It's. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone see, there was an S, a Saturday Night Live sketch that went viral that was parodying lesbian dramas, um, like sad lesbian historical dramas, and there was a quote in it. Lesbian Weekly says, well, yeah, I'm going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's like, you know, when there's, when there's a scarcity of culture, mm. you really go for whatever slim pickings are there, yes. and even if it's not your favourite thing you go, well, this is the only thing representing me, so mm. I'm, I'm obliged yes. to sit with this. And I'm grateful for the crumbs. And some people, I'm sure, love the L word, so this is not to be dismissive or rude about mm. the L word, but some lesbians I know didn't... I mean, we have quite a famous lesbian in the front row, Ellen Jones. Um, I just noticed that you're there. Is it okay to call you famous lesbian, Ellen Jones? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, <laughs> could we have some commentary for you about the, from me, about the L word? So, I've been out for 10 years now, and I still have not seen the L word. But I think that might be an age thing and a generational thing, because when I came out, there was the beginnings of representation. It wasn't brilliant representation like the L word, but it was more mainstream. And also, when I came out, I was like 13, 14, Mm. which is not maybe the age that the L word was aimed at. Um, Were you too young to watch the L word? When was the L word on? (laughs) Seriously, when was the L word? Uh, yeah, on, I think like, it must have been about. Was it on then. Dave? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. No, like no, that's no. On but Dave. it definitely, there were definitely, you know, where it definitely was was in uh, montage clips set to sexy songs on YouTube, circa about 2012. So right. that was, you know, that's the only representation I had that and Tegan and Sarah. Mm. Tegan, Tegan and, and Sarah. Sarah. Tegan and Sarah. What, what, singers. Oh, singers. Oh, I see. Singers, twins. So, so as a as a teenager. You, your full representation with the singers Tegan and Sarah, and who else? I actually came out to my brother through a Sue Perkins show. Because oh. I wasn't allowed to tell my brother that I was gay. He's a few years younger than me, and my parents were sort of worried that he'd tell other people um, without my permission because he wouldn't understand it was a big deal. So I made him watch this series called, I think, Heading Out, and it was essentially about a, a, a 40-something lesbian wanting to come out to her family and never having the courage to do it. So I just made my brother watch every episode until he got the gist. And he was an 11-year-old watching a show about a middle-aged woman coming out. She was a vet. It was on the BBC. I recorded it, and we'd watch it on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, it's just an after-school special for him, isn't it? <laughs> it was... It was While well, everyone else is watching Home and Away. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Top literally. of the pops. But and your I, poor brother is having to watch a sitcom. But no, I found out that lesbians existed from the Vicar of Dibley. So I didn't know that there was an option. I literally found out from Rachel Hunter being in her underwear and uh, Dawn French joking about lesbians, uh, basically joking, you know, the vicar and Alice joking about if they were to be lesbians, who they get with. I'd never heard the word before. And that's when you thought, oh, hold oh. on, that, stop, 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 freeze the, freeze the TV, that's me. Yep. Did you? Yeah, well, oh. you, if you don't have a word for it. You know, mm. I grew up in a small... I grew up in a... Funnily enough, I grew up in a house where no one knew that gay... I didn't... Like, we didn't mention the word gay mm. at all. And for a long time... So I thought that my parents must be homophobic because it was never mentioned. I just didn't know gay people existed. Well, they were just homo silent. Yeah, well, it, there's a reason. It's the same reason my mum cries at 80s pop music. Her cousin had died of AIDS. So oh. that's why it was never spoken about because it was a traumatic thing for her. He was a young, prominent writer and activist... He died in his 20s, stand-in father figure for her. So that's why. And so it's been really interesting looking back at this sort of history of not knowing that gay people existed. And now, you know, everyone I know is queer and being so integrated in the community. But it's literally in the last 10 years gone from nothing to everything. And I think the media is doing that too. Mm-hmm. We've gone from nothing to everything, but that everything isn't positive all the time either. There's a real mm. mix. Thank you, Ellen. Big round applause for Ellen. Yeah. Ellen Jones, everybody. Amazing. Do you want to play another one of your Ima? Um, yes, I do. They're all funny. Um, <laughs> let's have number two. I'm 
LGBTQ+. But the one thing that I absolutely cannot get on board with is cuff jeans. They don't look good on me personally. I'm short as it is, and they make my legs look even shorter. I'm not exactly sure how or why it started to become a symbol for the LGBTQ plus community. Don't get me wrong, if you want to cuff your jeans, then go for it. All I'm saying is that I don't understand it. I don't understand why, and it doesn't look good on me personally. Uh, Okay. It sounded like that person recorded that on a motorway. Yes. So I didn't quite... I, I think the gist of it was... She said, I can't get on board with cuff jeans, which apparently are associated with the LGBTQ community. Yes. So that means like turn ups on jeans, mm. which I think is to do with butch culture. Right. These Your, are, yours are, are rolled up, but I wouldn't yeah, say they so were cuff. Well, I'd call that a cuff Would situation. You? But you just last week were asking for the boot cup to come back. No? I was. I was. So yeah. maybe the turn up is going but I think it's to do with butch culture and and I think it's quite funny because there's so much fashion stuff mm. with queer culture that has history and you're so you arrive in it and you're supposed to know what it means mm. and there's a lot of like when you first go to a gay club let's say you went to XXL I'm talking as a gay man here a lot of people in like workwear and like high-vis vests and you're like what's going on here then what, like what, like the village like dungarees people. or yeah, there's a lot of that, and there's quite a lot of queer history of clothes mm. that you kind of, um, I suppose, what that is, it's butch, isn't it? And then it's also village people. Well, since <laughs> since I've come out as bisexual, and also not just come out, but explored my bisexual side yes. because I I didn't know, you know, I thought I was bisexual, but I really needed to check, and I know that sounds like. <laughs> I know it sounds, because people say, well, how did you know you were straight? And it's like, well, because the world told me I was. Mm. So it was something I needed to explore and check. One of the things I'm talking about my new stand-up show is a lot of it is about coming out and my first sexual experience with a woman. And I I have, I think, gone through a little bit of more of an androgynous phase. Mm. But I like... Um, I know I'm quite femme tonight, and I might, my default is femme, but again, how much of that is what I saw modelled as a child, yeah. I don't know. Obviously, if I'd been dropped onto a desert island, I wouldn't have... I, I wouldn't dress like this, because I wouldn't know these things. These would, this wouldn't be iconography that I identified with. Mm. Um, but my kind of androgyny is like a Marlena Dietrich dinner jacket. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. I like to wear like... Um, black tie or something mm-hmm. like that. But it is, it's quite glam femme androgyny, if you see mm. what I mean. I, yes. I don't really just want to be in a jumper and jeans. Doesn't feel... Someone else... Are you agreeing with me vociferously? Because this is Lulu, who I talked to in the Lulu was the supposed warm-up. to be tonight's guest. I mean, of course she's going to join in. Lulu was nearly... You were nearly <laughs> dropped for Lulu. I'm so sorry, Chris, but she was being riveting. At any point, you just push a buzzer and we'll swap. Oh, if I push that buzzer there, you'll fall through the stage, just so you know. <laughs> I did think uh, this is a bit like an episode of 101, Room 101, actually. <laughs> it's so like that. Um, so, yeah, I talked yes. to Lulu with it. I'm not a jeans and a jeans. I'm not, I don't look good in casual clothes, and I don't feel good in casual clothes. But also, isn't that because... So you've arrived at more of your bisexual side a bit later in life, let's say. How dare you <laughs> imply, um, imply that I'm and, not 22. But you weren't 11. And, but, you know, it's like... Therefore, is there some kind of onus on like, oh, I need to bisexual my look? Whereas actually, you are a, a creation of an amalgamation of time when mm-hmm. you've lived a certain. I've always you know, been attracted to it though. When I was a Jehovah's Witness, mm-hmm. I once wore a tie and a jacket. You're not allowed to wear trousers to the meetings. You can wear trousers on your day off, but never to the meetings and never out knocking on doors. It would be a scandal if you wore trousers. Even like really? business, you can't, you just can't. You just couldn't, couldn't, couldn't. But once I wore a tie mm-hmm. with a jacket and an elder said, you can't do that, it's androgyny. Um, it's completely not allowed. So specifically androgyny wasn't allowed? Yes. It, it's any, any kind of drag. Uh, obviously, it would be more, there would be more of a high alert if a man was in drag than a woman because of the way society operates and cultural yeah. norms. But the actual wearing of a tie... And then there was a part at the assembly that I, I had to do. So the assembly is like a big meeting where lots of congregations meet. And I had to do a part on the stage. Women are not allowed to preach, but we could be talked to. So you could either do little <laughs> plays or be interviewed. And so it's no wonder I'm a podcaster. And 
I was interviewed about it and I was a whole part about how women need to be in femme clothes and men need to be in masculine clothes. And I, I was in that part, very proud to say. Uh, so, Thank yeah. You. So Thank if you. I wear right. now black tie or if I wear trousers and a, and a tie, it feels very sexy and very rebellious. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think the, the sort of gay male version of that is you, well, like this. What do you call this? Plaid. Like, that's something that people play with. You know, it's because it's like considered hyper masculine cowboy and all of that. And you sort of you take those codes and play with them because some of them match you, some of them don't. And you I love that bit of queerness that you're sort of privy to all of that and what clothes say mm. about you and how you can mess with it. So is this a broke back study that you've got? Well, this is it. But then you're then you're boxed into like it's broke back. It's like yeah. but actually all, you know, that's what people wear. Men wear lots of plaid. But it is to do with hyper-masculinity and all that stuff, isn't oh. it? It's to do with the Marlboro Man. Was he wearing plaid? Someone was. So that, that, in that genre, certainly. Yeah. What clothes are you genuinely drawn to, though, Chris? Or do you not know? Is there not a genuine drawn to because it's so mixed up with the iconography of queerness for you? Um, the pandemic was awful for everybody, but it did bring loungewear back. <laughs> and if I... I remember having a conversation with my mum when I was, like, four, and... Um, I was standing at the bottom of the stairs and I used to sing memories from cats every morning. <laughs> um, and I would wear a tracksuit. And I remember having a conversation with my mum and my sister and I said, I will never not wear a tracksuit, ever. And they were like, Christopher, that's not going to work. Like, you, you will you'll want to wear other things. I was like, no, I want to wear a tracksuit forever. And what happened is that basically I'm sort of always secretly trying to wear a tracksuit in some way. Oh. Like, what jeans so uncomfortable? You, I love that you're wearing, that you were singing Cats every morning. I just absolutely yeah. love that. So every morning you'd get up and sing Memories from Cats in a tracksuit. Yeah. A macavity. And was it, was the tracksuit a sort of homage to Cats because they were in that kind of slinky loungewear of no. dancer clothes? No, it was just that I just liked wearing this navy blue tracksuit and I couldn't understand why other people wanted to wear other things. And it was comfortable. I mm. wanted to be comfortable. So actually then that's another I'm an LGBTQ plus person, but because I never, I've never felt fashionable. You mm. know what I mean? I've never really got it. And actually queer people are meant to be very fashion forwards. Mm. And I'm always like... I think it's... I, 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 my guess about that is... If you do not, if you are not granted ownership over the central space, mm -hmm. and you need to create a community which, by necessity, is in the margins, mm. you need to find each other, mm. and you also need to make a statement of we do not want to be in that tri in that in that larger community. We don't want to be there. We want to be here. And one way of doing that is to say it's what I call. I used to call tribing up, but I I have heard that the word tribe can be problematic. Mm. So I'm looking for another word that it's like teaming up or ga ganging up sounds wrong. It sounds like you're ganging up with someone else, but it's like yeah. I identify with. Yeah. I know that you, are, you feel like me about something. And I think it's true for all marginalized communities yes. that the way we decorate ourselves becomes incredibly important. You know, the suffragettes yeah. were wore colors, yeah. green and purple and white, find each other. And we say, I know if you're wearing that piece of jewellery, I know that you think like me. We might be two very grand ladies standing in a drawing room with lots of men around us and having to say the right thing here. But afterwards, I'm going to take a turn around the room with you and you and I are going to talk. It's wonderful that though, isn't it? Yes. It's so magical and, and that secret language. And um, this historian called Justin Bengry came on the podcast last week and he was talking about... Um, Exactly that, how in history, um, how queer people communicated who they were to each other and certain kinds of clothes, if you wore a red tie or if you curled your hair in a certain way. And that's how they could communicate silently. Slang as well. We're together, yeah. Amazing stuff like that, that just all ways of identifying and finding yeah. it, especially when something's illegal mm. and underground. You have to find your, your secret signals, but then that creates culture. Yes. And that's language is culture, and the language of clothing it becomes part of your culture. But he also said it was a nightmare because then all the straight people started copying it, and then no one could tell. <laughs> Taylor's old as time. Uh, yeah. I've heard that same story from African Americans uh, mm. with white people copying, and uh, I'm sure black British people with white people copying, and I'm sure black queer people with you know other groups copying. 
when you make something cool, that's what cult what culture really is, is anything that's sticky, anything that's, you know, many, 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 many dishes were tried in France. But what is French cuisine is what was sticky, what people liked, and then what, what other people wish to replicate. Mm. That's sort of what culture is. Um, but we must be careful not to crash it. Uh, it's something that I found when I, I went to an underwear party in um, Fire Island, on Fire Island, and um, the guys I was with... I have some stand-up about it that I was going to do. I don't know if I'm going to have time. Uh, but it's out of my new show, but I thought, oh, I'll just do a bit of it. Um, but the boys I was with... Um, said, oh, come with us behind this curtain. You never want to do that, Jessie. Well, do you know, <laughs> and I said, I said, no, I said, no, I don't want to because I'm a guest here, I'm not a tourist. Mm. And if they go back there, these handsome, young, gorgeous, glorious men, I said, if you go back, there'll be something in it for those men behind the curtain to be mm. watched by you. If I go back, it's like, it's not a sideshow. It doesn't feel right. Yeah. It doesn't feel right to me. And I just said, no, I'd rather not. So what I'm saying is sometimes blowjobs can be cultural appropriation. <laughs> it's funny, though, because actually lots of people wrote in saying that they don't get saunas and that whole darkroom culture, which is quite queer. And, mm. um, you know, because there's like... I mean, imagine explaining this to my mother, but, like, there's a nightclub, and then over there, there's a rubber wall, and everyone just has sex in there. But that's quite normal for a, a queer... A rubber wall? Often it's rubber. Is it? Well, Why is that? Because it's easy to clean. wipe down. I think so. Mm, practical. But lots of people saying they don't really get that you're supposed, you know, you're supposed to know that you go to a sauna and then you have little looks and then you have sex with people mm. and all of that stuff, which I don't understand myself. It's no you're judgment. not a fan no of the judgment. sauna. I. Um, the face that you're making doesn't imply no judgment, I'll be honest. Do you know what it is? No, no, no. Do you know what, uh, the face is about how I feel about it. I said this to Russell T. Davies on one of our episodes. My problem with the sauna, right, which is mm. you go to the sauna and then there's people in there. Is it a literal sauna? Like, it's like steam yes. and people there's are sitting pool, in the steam. Yeah, there's steam rooms, there's a pool. Are the there famous pri- one was chariots. Pr- private break, yeah, pr- are private breakout rooms? Correct. So then I can say to you in the sauna, I mean, not me, obviously, but... Yeah. Uh, if You're I, welcome. Yeah, yeah, but... <laughs> mm, um, it's like the curtain all over again. <laughs> Um, I could then say to you, oh, would you like to go to a private room with me? <clears throat> yeah. And then you'd say, oh, yes, that'd be lovely. Or, oh, no, thank you. I have just thing. here for esteem. Here's the thing. None of it is said. It's all looks and communication with eyes. I think... I'd struggle Does anyone with that. know the rules? Um, There's a chap there who knows the rules. Yeah. Could you please... Get that we man have... the microphone. Microphone, please, microphone, please, because someone's about to tell us the rules. So, but, while we're getting you the microphone... I just feel like I'm going to bump into people I know. You're too British for a sauna, aren't you? Well, this is what... uh, Yeah, and I'm like... What if you were in, like, I don't know, Boise, Idaho? Could you go to a sauna there? I mean, maybe. But, like, it's it's a bit late for that now, William. Happy Valentine's. Um, William's brought you you flowers on stage now. It'd be awkward for you to say, of course, every time I'm in Boise. But I just... I couldn't... Yeah, I feel like... Putting the boys into Boise, Idaho. but, (laughs) But every time you go... To a gay club, you know people because it's a, it's a small mm. family. And then mm. it's like, oh, we had sex the other day. Weird. Mm. For me. Go on. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, we need somebody uh, 25% less uptight than Chris Sweeney to explain the yeah. rules of a sauna to us, please. 85%. <laughs> um, I'm not sure there are any rules. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, sometimes you, it's true. Most people don't speak. I agree. Chris was right. Really? You look at each other and... And in London, actually, people don't speak much because you've got loads of tourists and people who use English. Also, they're probably on a conference call. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be on a Zoom in a sauna. Yeah. You can just, talk, people just dialing talk. in. And actually, if you sit in the pool, people chat. And oh. it's and my I, I, I don't have a huge amount of experience. Mm-hmm. But, um, There's no need to lie. <laughs> <laughs> But my experiences have always been super positive and, like, people are super kind. And That's yeah. lovely. Can I ask you something about this, just eye contact? Because I think it's very handy and I wish it existed in the straight world slash lesbian world or same-sex world. Uh, on, uh, you know what I mean. I'll just say lesbian world shorthand. Because I had a neighbour who was a gay man and he said, oh, I'm having a fling with a chap across the road. And I said, oh, how did you meet? He said, we made eye contact. 
And then I followed him back to his flat and we had sex. <laughs> and mm. I went, so, but at what point, and I asked him about it, I said, so at what point does one of you say, oh, would you like to come back in for a coffee? And then one thing leads to another. He said, no, we made eye contact and the eye contact implied heavily that I should follow him inside his home <laughs> and take my trousers off. Now, I yeah. could not, I don't care who it is or where I was, I would need to verbally confirm that. I just <laughs> cannot imagine a stare so compelling that I would be like, I know exactly what that means and I feel safe just going into that man's house or that lady's house and just starting to strip off. Because I would feel, she might go, oh no, I had something in my eye. Or I was, I was, I was looking at the person behind you yeah. or I was thinking about, oh, I've forgotten my shopping. You know, like, I would not, I, what, what can you do the look for me now so I can see what it is? Because I've never understood what this look is. That is the, no conversation. I don't think I can, sorry. What? But... <laughs> Just is it because you're not attracted to me right now? Because that's right. That's it's right. right. Well, that's rude. That's but I, <laughs> I feel like, you know, that's desert island rules. We're the only people left on a desert island. No one's coming to rescue us. If we don't have sex with each other, we're never going to have sex again. Get into that mode so you can imagine being attracted to me. Um, I'm trying very hard to think you're like... I, I'll, I'll, listen, I've told you I can turn up in my androgynous suit. Um, it's the best I can offer you. You're Johnny and Dirty Dancing now. That's right, yes. Okay, I know how to be Johnny. I'll do a very good Johnny for you. <laughs> and hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I'm going to try and get... Okay, I'm going to try and do a look. Okay, I'm going to try and do my best look that I would do on the street in Camden. That is great. Just That's to... perfect. Is yeah. it? Is it? Yeah. Okay, can you do the look back that tells me for an absolute certainty I'm free to follow you home? Oh, yes, I see that now. Yes, no, no. <laughs> yes, it, that works. Remarkable. Okay, I've got it. Thank well, you. That's really nailed that down for me. That That's was brilliant. Absolutely remarkable, yeah. We call it gay eyes. Gay eyes. Mm. When you're walking down the street, gay men mainly... Would you say this is true? You get gay eyes off someone. Is this, has this evolved because it was illegal? Yes, I because think so. Because if it were not illegal, people would have done the, the thing of going, oh, you look nice. Well, that's the only way you could do it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. because otherwise, if you said to somebody, they might go, oh, police. Yeah, someone told me the rules, actually. Um, <gasps> I could have said this ten minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> that, um, it's, you, you do the look, and then you walk past them, you look back once... And then if you look back the second time and they still look back, that's bingo. Yeah. House. Bingo. Yeah, house. Yeah, Word, back to wo- my house. Back to my house. <laughs> Wordle in two. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, baby. Um, <laughs> I, I think it would be... I mean, I, I'm, I know about all... I, if it were not for all the horrible oppression and uh, fear of violence and it's still being illegal in any number of countries... Um, I think it would be great to be a gay man. Mm. Like, I I think, I know there's all that, so I just want to acknowledge the awful things that have happened to gay men. But the good stuff about being a gay man, I think, I just am quite envious of it. There's something so sexy and exciting about it, and alive, the culture really draws me in. Do you find that arriving in the bisexual world, let's say, uh, that you are going around to strangers' houses or whatever, and... Gay men do that without thinking about it. And as a woman doing that, is that different? Uh, I have a whole piece in my show about the first time I ever stayed over at a woman's house and the, all of the, you know, the things, the wonderful things about that and the sexy things and stuff. But the biggest revelation for me was at no point in the whole evening did I ever think, you could just kill me now. Like, it was extraordinary. Mm. I went, oh, I've, at no point was I frightened that she was going to kill me. At no point. And it didn't even occur to me that she would or could. It felt like a sleepover mm-hmm. with a girl. And I've had loads of those before mm. I'd had any sexual experience. And it was extraordinary. And I unpack that more in my show. But, you know, I've then since then talked to gay men who've said that they have had very frightening experiences uh, with gay men who, you know, it's not straightforward. It's not about being same sex Mm. uh, at all. And I think, you know, there's more to unpack and explore there. But, yeah, it's a revelation. Mm. Yeah. I've never had any of those kinds of experiences, but I know they do happen a lot. But um, it's also 
I don't know, it's not something people talk about or think about, but it's, yeah, it's a real and present danger, I suppose. Some gay men have talked about that to me. Mm. Hello Guilty Feminists, it's Jessica Regan here, delighted to announce a very special event. We are holding a Big Speeches online workshop on Saturday the 26th of March from 3pm to 6.30pm. But here's the thing, it's pay what you can. So whatever you can afford, um, please do join us, open to all. Then normal service resumes and we are back on the last Sunday of every month, April through to June. So that's Sunday the 24th of April, Sunday the 29th of May and Sunday the 26th of June from 3pm to 6.30pm as those times seem to suit our international listeners. So uh, if you are looking to boost your confidence in the workplace or in any space really, if you are looking for more confidence with public speaking and communication, come to a warm and friendly and joyful and supported atmosphere as I guide you through all the things that have helped me be a performer that will serve you in the real world. Hello, Guilty Feminist, it's Deborah. I am going to be at my favourite ever venue, Vicar Street, Dublin, with Alison Spittle on the 14th of March, and we've got some incredible guests lined up as well. So get your tickets now. On the 20th of March, we are in Oxford with Sarah Keyworth, Athena Kablenu, Celia A.B. and Grace Petrie. So get your tickets now for that. And the tour continues throughout the spring and summer. We are coming somewhere near you, so look at our website now to find out when and where. On the 21st of March... We are doing a Guilty Feminist episode with Millie Bobby Brown from Stranger Things at Enola Home. What? Susan McComa is co-hosting. Sadly, tickets are sold out, but we will be releasing a few more closer to the date. So if you want to be first in line for tickets, join our Patreon. If you want to be second in line for those tickets, join our mailing list. To do that, go to guiltyfeminist.com and go to the About page. On the 22nd of March at King's Place... We are doing the only podcast and the only live show with Hannah Gadsby where she's talking about her book, 10 Steps to the Net. It's just going to be her and me in conversation. So get your tickets now for that. That's going to sell out really, really fast. On the 31st of March, Campus Springtime, which was Campus Christmas, we've got an incredible lineup, including me and Tom Allen hosting and Self Esteem, plus many brilliant others. If you've got a ticket for Campus Christmas, it's automatically been transferred. If you want a ticket, go to our website. There's not many left. From the 26th of April to the 7th of May, I am doing The Guilty Feminist Stands Up at Soho Theatre. This is a show about me coming out and going in. Uh, The original run at Soho Theatre sold out and the Women of the World show has sold out. So if you want to see the stand-up show, book a ticket now for Soho Theatre. In July, I will be in Australia and New Zealand. We'll be touring around with Grace Petrie and some of your very favourite Guilty Feminist co-hosts. So please book now. And you can join Patreon for ad-free episodes and exclusive Zoom hangouts at patreon.com slash guilty feminist. Don't forget to listen to Absolute Power and Media Storm, both brilliant podcasts from the House of the Guilty Feminist. And if you could do us a favour, if you've not subscribed to the Guilty Feminist, just quickly click on that subscribe button now. It really helps us keep the podcast going. And now back to the podcast. Rob says, uh, this is not a voice note, this is just written down. Uh, It's always a surprise that he makes furniture. As an LGBTQ plus person, no one ever realises that he makes... People are always surprised that he makes furniture. He makes furniture? Yeah, and people go, I don't think gay men make furniture. I don't think that at all. I think... Well, if you're going to devalidate Rob's experience... Sorry. (laughs) Sorry, Rob. Sorry, Rob. Rob, are you here? But I know... One of my friends, his boyfriend was Instagramming making furniture and I said, are you more attracted to him when he's making furniture? And he was like, oh my God, yes, of course. Yes. He's so hot when he's making furniture. Like the guy off the repair shop. They're always... They're, they're always... Happy Valentine's. I, what do you think they're doing tonight? I mean, bricklaying I would see, but making furniture is a rom-com job. Like it's Because well, that's what Thingy did in Sex and City, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's such a rom-com job. Men in rom-coms 
generally are doing something they don't want to do, and when they meet the woman of their dreams, uh, she helps them understand that what they really want to do is make handcrafted coffee tables. <laughs> and he helps her understand that she wants to open a cupcake bakery. And yes, then, and oh then, my God. And, that's ev- and that makes, that's what makes them realise she's the one for me, he's the one for me, because they've unlocked the inner baker slash carpenter. Like and I always the... just think, I've never, ever been attracted to someone who said, you know what you should do, change your career. I'm like, just stop being controlling and manipulative. Fuck off. I just don't get it. But it's the sort of shorthand for he's really seen me or she's really seen me. But I think it's very artistic. I can absolutely see... So, Rob, Mm. I'm not undermining your experience, but I am saying... I I am saying I'm projecting onto you a lot of gay, masculine sex appeal with that. And I feel many people, to uh, assist your worldview as someone who can loud, be loud and proud and also craft coffee tables, <laughs> I think we see you as the sexy gay Aiden, The Gaiden. Yeah, Gaiden. There we go. Lots of people cannot get on board with drag. Um, lots of queer people. And one person said, which I thought was interesting, the text is tiny. Um, this is Catherine. As a woman who is a feminist, I find it to be often degrading to women. Mm. Interesting. Discuss. Discuss. Does okay, anyone, I'm, I'm going to need you to weigh in on that, I think. It's none of my business. People should do whatever they want. But that ultra-feminine presentation that can sort of cartoonize femininity, mm-hmm. I imagine, is a release for some people doing it, but actually creates issues around, should that be an expression of femininity? Mm. What do you think? <sighs> I like gender expression being a play space. Me too. And I like it because I want all human beings to be able to play with makeup, with hair, with clothing, with colour, because I think when the human race is truly evolved, and I hope that we're getting there, we will all be able to choose and select and have fun and and one day play with big bright eyeshadow and feathers and mm. the next day feel like I just want to be in my navy blue tracksuit yes. you know and it's to me it should be a space we can play with where I feel drag is a mockery of women is sometimes when I see straight men on sketch shows and it's tone, isn't it? You know, mm. there's something a tad misogynistic about it. Like when only straight men were allowed sketch shows um, for decades, they would play all the funny female characters and, it, and those characters sort of take the piss out of women. And then if they wanted a hot girl, they'd hire a hot girl to come in and be hot. So then they mm. could flirt with her or in some way or another humiliate her or she could just be a straight woman. That I have problems with. Uh, but I think with drag, where you're dealing with a community that has been shut down anything which allows that community to come out and be large, I'm in favour of. And I trust that the individuals individuals within it will treat femininity with respect. And if they don't, then individuals don't, and I would like them to, but also human beings are flawed. Yes. I think, because I was thinking, what would be, I'm a feminist but, and I was going to say... Uh, I'm a feminist, but as a kid, I used to love dressing up in pink dresses and all the rest of it, which was a terrible, you know, classic tropes of femininity. But I'm not sorry, because I loved it. Because I loved playing around, like you were just saying, with Mm -hmm. femininity and gender and all that. And, and, And honestly, if if little girls want to dress in pink dresses, there's nothing less than about pink dresses. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with pink dresses. It's if that's the only option they have or they're guided into that, then it it becomes problematic. But pink dresses are wonderful. What's wrong with pink dresses? I love pink dresses. Let's all get in pink dresses. But it's just just when it's the only option or when that seen as the the, 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 some value of a girl, that's when it's problematic. But I would love us all, I would love children to all be given, just take everyone into a room with all of the options and let's play. And I would love grown-ups to do workshops like that as well. Yes. Glitter is wonderful. I, I I never understand how the patriarchy let us have makeup. It's the best thing. <laughs> um, and on that note, Chris, <clears throat> what I would like to say is I feel like this is episode one mm-hmm. of 
the Guilty Homo Sapien. So would you be open to another episode live? Okay. We'd love that. Can we, I think, because I think we've only just started. I feel like we just dipped our toe in. And I think it would be great to do more and uh, have more coming from the audience as well. Yes. Um, would you be up for that? Yes. So if we let you know when our next date is through our podcast, you'd come for it. Great. This isn't just a one-off for you, is what I'm saying. I don't want to put it on again if you're like, no, we saw it. That's fine. <laughs> no, no, we done. get it. Uh, all right. Uh, so our musician is a wonderful new talent. Her hit song, uh, I have been playing absolutely on a loop uh, for the last few months. Please welcome... The incredible Maisie! Hi. Hi, Maisie. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you for having me. It's so lovely to be here. Happy Valentine's Day. You too. Is there anything you'd like to tell us about the song before you sing it? Or about you? Wonderful. Take it away, Maisie. I wish I never held your hand at a friend's house. Jump around, losing out on what we want now. Cause I was just too young. I wish I never heard you speak, I need a new sound Every time you speak your mind, it makes me go out You're kind of cool anyway You're kind of cool in a way If you really need me, then I'll be there If you ever want me, you know that's not fair So if you ever need me, I'll be there Fuck, I think I'm in love be the one Fuck, I guess I'm in love With you With you, with you, with you, with you With you, with you, with you, with you I left a little bit of you inside my old mind I cut it all except the bits I knew I'd never find I guess it's kind of messed up I lost a little bit of me inside your old place A little bit of me I don't think I can replace But you don't really care Do you even care? If you really need me, then I'll be there If you ever want me, you know that's not fair So if you ever need me, I'll be there Fuck, I think I'm in love I think you might be the one Fuck, I guess I'm in love with you
Julie, where can people download that song? Uh, well, it's, you know, on whatever you listen to music on, Spotify, Apple Music. Um, if you just search Maisie, which is me, M-A-I-S-I, um, Guess I'm in Love, and then you should be able to find it. Great. And we can follow you on Instagram at Maisie, Maisie, Maisie? Indeed. At Maisie, 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 or only eyes. You don't need any E's or Y's. Um, yeah. uh, if you if you have an ease or wise, keep them for someone else. Um, uh, it's a, I, I think you're a great, it's a great song. You can see why I've been listening to it on a loop. Uh, if we get it on, where do we get it on that you get money for it? Uh, well, Bandcamp or? Uh, well, if everywhere, I get like a tiny bit. But I suppose the best would be downloading it on Apple. But you know, what, what is it a sound card? Or so? I thought there was one where you actually get paid. No. I mean, you know, everywhere says that. Yeah, but I thought there was one where you got paid more. Okay, clearly it doesn't matter where you get it from because Maisie won't get paid. Um, but she does it for the love of the sport. So, uh, and she'll get she'll get pennies. Uh, so maybe buy it. Uh, will you have a CD out soon or an EP? Uh, no plans yet, but I think you know hopefully one day. So you know. Would you buy an EP if Maisie made one? Okay. Incentive, incentive. In the meantime, spread it, uh, share it on your socials. Uh, and get uh, get some get some energy and action going behind Maisie. I think she's a really fantastic new artist. And her uh, uh, is, is, is your agent in the audience? Uh, I think she might be. That's... She's got an agent, is what I'm saying. Yeah. She's got an agent. She's proper. Uh, Maisie, everybody. <laughs> You have been listening to The Guilty Homo Sapien with me, Deborah Francis White, and Chris Sweeney, and the music from Maisie. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The Guilty Purpose theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Solinsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Zoe, Sally, and everyone at King's Place, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltypurpose.com. That was very good. That was I strong had, work. I had a boo. Hmm? I had a boo. You had a boo? It's just a tiny one. Who, well, I might have been, they might have been saying boo urns. Okay. It's okay. a Simpsons joke for those okay. of you who don't you know. Do. Huh? Okay, ready? This is the Guilty Homo Sapien, the podcast in which Blix. Oh, mofo. <laughs> okay. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.